So welcome to the Aaron Warner podcast on iCode Media. I'm excited today because I have got my good friend, one of my best friends, Matt Clear, and uh, said, Matt, we need to sit and talk because you, in my mind, are living the American dream. And you laughed at me. Yeah, well, <laughs> it, it, it's somebody's dream. I, uh, you know, I don't know, a nightmare in my mind. Um, I, you know, I, I, kind, I mean, I have a lot of stuff and I do a lot of things, um, yeah. but I, I'm just living my life, man. Yeah. You know? Well, I think that's the dream, and, and I'll get into why, but let's let's let everybody in, meet you. Well, first off, thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it is a pleasure to be here. So, um, what? I, I'm Matt Clear, and uh, I own a few businesses. I'm a general engineering contractor. I own Active Shooter Defense School, and I have Clear Sky Aviation. Yep. So, and then before all that... Oh, yeah, let's, yeah, let's, 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 what brought oh, you, you want, to you want this? the long version? I want the long version. So uh, originally, uh, after high school, I was a auto mechanic for Chrysler, okay. and uh, I was very successful. At 23 years old, I was borderline six figures. 24, I was six figures. And that's a long time ago, because I'm coming up on 50. And uh, so that was early 90s. And it was all commission-based. So okay. you had to be smart, and you had to be fast. And you had to own your own tools, and uh, but it was a good industry at the time. Uh, I was racing, uh, desert racing, doing the Baja 1000 races, doing the uh, motocross. I was really good in the desert, not so great on the motocross track. Okay. I mean, a real good local guy, but when you get into that, you know, top 40 riders, I was like 45. <laughs> and uh, and but it was fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. We were doing that, you know, growing up water skiing and dirt biking and jet skiing and doing all the things you do as kids in the 90s without the internet and then uh what year was it 2001 planes hit the towers right 2001 mm -hmm. and 32 days later i was sworn into the united states navy gave all that crap up for uh to go to the show i guess i don't know i spent uh 13 years in the navy and um, ended up getting, I was, I was a combat engineer and uh, a CB for, Navy CBs for those of you who don't know what that is. But you could be a CB and be attached to the SEAL teams. So I got to do that. I was very good at what I did as a mechanic, you know. Yep. So in the Navy, uh, being a, an outside mechanic was, you know, most of these kids went to Navy school on how to be a mechanic, but at the same time they had to learn how to be in the Navy. So they didn't get to spend, you know, 11 years being a mechanic yeah, and right. growing up racing cars and, and building hot rods as a kid and wrenching on your dirt bike. So I was way ahead of the power curve. So a natural placement for me would to be with the SEAL teams where they yeah. needed top tier guys. And, and I brought that top tier asset of being that mechanic. Well, I was also a competition shooter and I was also grew up boxing. And so I just, it was just a very good fit. And uh, for me anyway, and I loved it. I loved every minute of it. I uh, got a bunch of deployments to Iraq um, and uh, and other places, and it was a good 13 years, 12 years. I think I got out. She probably had Danielle here because I think I got <laughs> out in 13. So it was either 12 and a half or 13 and a half years, um, and uh, a lot of injuries, and it was time for me to go. Yeah. So then I opened all three of those businesses that you just talked about. Um, I opened Active Shooter Defense School before I even exited the Navy. Once I knew that I was going to be out of the Navy, I knew that I needed an exit plan. And I thought, well, let's, let's teach firearms. And, um, and, I, and I opened that technically before I exited the Navy. That was great. It's a great school. It's a great income. But you're primarily working weekends. So, you know, teaching Joe Public how to shoot guns, it's, it's great income. It's, it's fine. And, uh, but then I didn't have enough income to fly airplanes and do and get helicopters and race dirt bikes and do all the stuff that I wanted to do the other five days of the week because I was just kind of hanging out. So I made a mistake of doing my own driveway at my house in La Mesa. And I did a bunch of little walls and planters and stonework and I made this beautiful driveway. And a friend of mine, SEAL team guy, comes over, Kevin, and he goes, he goes oh, who's the contractor that did this? This is great. What do you, th you know, oh, I, I forgot that part. While I was a mechanic, way back when, and while I was still in the Navy, I was building pools. 
and I was working with uh, Alex Nikas was his name. He was a pool designer, so I would go manage the jobs and I would talk to the clients and and I, and I would make sure that the contractors were doing what they said they were doing. And and so anyhow, so I have a pretty good backbone in in general contracting all through those years. And so I did my driveway. Kevin comes over and I said, "Well, what do you think I did?" prior to the Navy, you know, and all this time. How do you think I'm making all this extra money? And he goes, all right, come over to my house. So we went over to his house. He lives on a, on a tentacle out here and uh, kind of near you. Okay. And, um, and it's a cul-de-sac on one of the tentacles of the hill. So we did a 55 foot wide th we, uh, retaining wall that was 13 feet tall, totally not permitted, but beautiful. And it was six, it added 16 feet of it to his yard where his original deck used to be. Then we built another 16 feet of deck on top of that. We did a recessed fire pit, all kinds of concrete work. It was beautiful. It's still, it's, it's gorgeous. I think I've shown it to you, but anyhow. Uh, during that job, I needed help. So I found this guy, Robert, that I used to work with and brought him down from LA. And, and we were on that job for probably about seven months. And in that time, we built a barbecue for the neighbor and a fire pit and then we did the other neighbor's driveway and we ended up working on about 80 percent of the houses on that cul-de-sac in, in one way or another and about halfway through that year i went I should probably go get my contractor's license so i kind of inadvertently opened dw because i didn't really want to do any of that so then at the end of that little run of cul-de-sacs i said i'm going to buy a bobcat and a little mini excavator and a dump truck, and I'm just going to break concrete out. That's what I'm going to do because I can work alone and I can make, you know, 1,500 bucks a day, gross doing it. You know, I'm just I'm just going to do that. That never happened. And every driveway that I broke out, I ended up reinstalling, and um, and yeah. So now I'm a contractor. I have employees and dump trucks and tractors and excavators and. Um, all the equipment you can think of. I have a yard that I have to pay rent on to store all this stuff. And uh, and our guys are working on your house as we speak. They are. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I, the deck is looking fantastic. It, it does. You know, we did, did yeah. your back. Yeah. yeah the and front deck's looking fantastic. The back yep. deck looks fantastic. Now the front deck. Yep. And uh, and it never ends. And, and it's good. It's it's good. I've got reasonably decent employees. And, um, and um the work just doesn't seem to want to end. And I've been trying to make it end for years. I've been trying to bankrupt this company for as long as it's been open because I don't really want to do it. But unfortunately, I'm good at it. And, uh, and here we are. And now we're dabbling in aviation. Yeah. So, uh, so we're teaching people how to fly airplanes and helicopters. We have a couple airplanes and a helicopter now. And, uh, and we use the helicopter in the shooting school and make it a make it a business because when you make it a business you can tax deduct it yes so so before we jump into the, the helicopter stuff the reason i said i think that i look at you and i'm like damn you're living the american dream because okay. in my mind the american dream isn't the the giant house trust fund baby on the hill okay. right we see that and and instagram shows it to us but i think the american dream is the opportunity to work to get to wherever you want to be Okay. So I remember sitting at a, a we met in one of your shooting school yeah, classes, that's right? right? Yeah. I, I About signed up for a uh, for a veterans course mm -hmm. somehow, even though I'm not a veteran. Right. And uh, and there was like three of us. Sure. Um, and uh, learned a ton. The uh, we became friends and, and going through. And I remember one day you said, "I want to learn how to fly helicopters." Mm -hmm. Not too long ago. Yeah. Three years. Four three years. Three years. Three years ago. Yeah. And you didn't have a helicopter. Nope. You hadn't flown helicopters. Mm -mm. You didn't have your pilot's license. Nope. Nope. You said, I want to fly helicopters. And so you, with the other two businesses, the contracting and the shooting school, you said, I'm, I'm, I, I, I researched it. I did, I did my homework. And now here's what I'm going to do. And you got your pilot's license in pretty uh, quick. Seven, six months. Right? Yeah. It was, it was fast. It was pretty quick. And, yeah. and, and, and you work seven days a week. Right? Yeah, you're not a trust fund baby, mm -hmm. right? So it's it, it, I don't want people to get the idea that like, oh, he's sitting on a bunch of money, bored oh. out of his mind at the <laughs> yeah, beach, right? No, um, yeah. no and, that and, that does not exist. No, so and. so that's why like it's the American dream because I mean I own a business. A lot of people who who listen own businesses, and sometimes we think like, God, I'm just I'm not making it. But part of the the fun is in the struggle. Oh, it's a struggle. 
Oh yeah. yeah, there's been days. Guys. There's been days that um, and and months that that payroll makes my bank account zero, mm-hmm. and and um, you know and you're, and you're wondering. I mean, you you know you yeah. know the deal, and 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 you've got entitled employees looking at you like, why can't you buy this piece of equipment? Why don't we have the, these materials? Why are we doing it this way? Well, dude, there's no money. Yeah. You don't you, you don't understand that we have to get to this point mm-hmm. for me to get that next chunk of money and um and you know you know you 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 think back to those days and and i'll get there again because i'm really good at spending money oh yeah you know i can spend (laughs) it i I can spend it i can spend everything that i know is coming in a matter of hours and um and but but you you end up figuring it out and and i don't think i have all the answers to get there but I, i i'm pretty good at figuring it out well, none of us have the answers, but yeah, you, yeah. you know you can find the answer, and you know that you're never going to be in a situation where you 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 can't find the answer. You can't find somebody who can help you find the answer. Right, and and I've also lived. You know, I mean, my dad was an aerospace engineer, but for many of those years, my mom didn't work, and and um, and, and you know, off and on she did. But I mean, we weren't poor, but we weren't rich. Middle class. Yeah, middle class. You know, aerospace engineer through the '60s, '70s. You know, through the through the '90s. I think he retired. I think he retired like '89. Um, but you know, we we had we had enough. You know, but then I moved out at 16. Okay. And so they made the so backtrack. I lived in Granada Hills, and I lived on the south side of the Granada Hills, which, which is, is outside of. We, LA area. Yeah, it's yeah. a it's San Fernando Valley, and in the in the '60s when they built the house, it was beautiful, and then through the '70s it was pretty good, and in the late '70s they built um, Section Eight housing all around us, and it was the three story square condo with the pool in the middle, and just one block away was just miles and miles of these, and and to the north and to the west, and and then we had Pettit Park which was just like a drug haven through the late 80s and 90s. And, I mean, I could get cocaine in my front yard. And it, it was, you know, just just from the bum walking by, hey, man, you know, and, and it was that easy. And um, by the time I was a teenager, that was a rough area. And the valley's flat, so all the riffraff can get everywhere, yeah. you know, with a bus or walking, you know. So there's no real pockets of goodness i mean there's some nice houses and that area still looks pretty nice but all you have to do is drive through a couple of the alleys and you'll find the couch that's on fire Mm -hmm. um so that when i so when i was 14 my dad saw that i was falling in with the wrong crowd and i was and um and and getting in fist fights almost daily you know and just just doing the wrong just just being a kid and he saw it and at that point we had already had two gunfights in front of my house by age 14. Okay, I would say one active gunfight and one Mexican standoff right in front of my house. And um, so, the, you know, anyway, he saw the writing on the wall. He sent me to Lake Tahoe to live with my aunt. Okay, and I was an asshole. Uh, and so that, I, I was able to live with her for about two years <laughs> before my uncle had had enough of my shit. I don't blame him. But what it did is it opened my eyes to what the rest of the world was actually like. I lived in the hole. The whole world's not a hole. I lived in the hole, and I figured it out. And uh, and then we also had the LA Unified Busing, so they'd bus all the Compton kids and inner city kids to our schools. And that was that was it, it was just just bad news. It was all kinds of bad ideas going on. Anyhow, uh, so age 14, I get sent up to live in Lake Tahoe. And it was great, right? But it only took me two years to mess up the whole thing because, you know, I was still that kid. Yeah. And and they said, okay, you got to go back. And I went, oh, I'm not going back. And so I sat down with my parents. I said, I'm going to go get a job. I'm going to go to school from, from 7 to noon, and then I'm going to go work. And that's what I did. And I finished high school. I actually just finished the GED program, got that done, but I did it, you know, I yep. mean, whatever, right? Yeah, and it. I would work at the ski resorts in the winter, and I would work construction in the summer, which is what everybody in Lake Tahoe did at the time. It's a poor man's town, rich man's playland, right? So you would work at the winter in the ski resorts, 
and you'd have your ski pass so you could go snow skiing all, all day and uh, and run a lift or pick up trash or do whatever you had to do to have a job at the ski resort yep. and um, and then work construction in the summer well I think I mean I know I was 18 and it was probably 74 84 94 out of been 20 so 1991 92 the winter was late okay and construction had stopped because everybody was getting ready for the winter yep. and I was out of money probably around Christmas time and there was no snow and nothing to do That's like it. right yeah. so I was like oh dad I gotta come home right and he's like alright and as I was driving out of Lake Tahoe it was dumping snow <laughs> and I was just just the whole, nine hours of just pissed driving my 78 Datsun truck home you know and, you know, and just angry and um, anyway I got home and he's like yep you can move back in but you gotta do something you know if you, if you can't find a job in construction you're gonna go to school and he says, with all your uh, mechanical background of racing dirt bikes and doing this, he said, why don't you just go sign up for like an auto repair certified course, right? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And, uh, and I went down to West Valley Occupational and I signed up for foreign auto repair. And I did the year long course in about four and a half months. Completed it, got what they called a NATEF certification and went to work at a company called Mark's Volvo. And it was an independent. And a friend of mine in the neighborhood had, had worked there for a few years, and he said, come on down. So I worked at Mark's for about a year, and uh, then I went over to Latori Volkswagen, which was in Reseda, and I was a dealership-level mechanic at 20. And then I realized that the American car lines paid damn near double what the foreign car lines paid, and I worked my... I actually went over to Santa Monica Volkswagen, which there's more money in that area, so I made more money yep. there. But then I made it to West Oaks Chrysler and Jeep, or uh, Shaver Pontiac and Jeep, and uh, and I stayed there for a long time, and that was where I made the most money. Nice. But that's you know, that's my get out of get out of uh, living in L.A. when you're 16, wow. so, you know. And all I wanted to do was stay in Tahoe, so I figured it out. And uh, being a 16-year-old renting a room with two other dudes, uh, no rules. Yeah, that's a world I don't know no rules uh had a three bedroom we had a three bedroom house that probably today would rent for four grand um that we were paying i think i paid 500 bucks and it included my utilities and uh and at the time it was a struggle yeah but during construction i was making i, was making, <laughs> I thought i had it made i was making 100 bucks a day <laughs> and i was so excited because i think minimum wage at the time was 350 or 325 right right but i was making you know the equivalent of that's good money. dollars an hour right? right and i was stoked i got a job making 100 bucks a day and all my friends were like what <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome and uh and, and, and you know at the time it was enough you know i had, an, I had enough money to to do whatever i needed to do through the summer and survive well and um yeah it was a good it was a good two years man so so how did you I mean, young kid on his own, mm -hmm. teenager, right? No rules. Yeah, no rules. Um, what, how did you stay focused? And I mean, you had fun, but how did you stay focused to work? What was the driving factor? So I've, I've picked up on, you know, you got your pilot's license quick. You did a year long program in a handful of months. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. What's the, what's the, the, and that's the, like the, the work ethic that drives the dream. You know, so. I would like to say that, uh, that it's all me and I figured it out on my own, but uh, I think one of the biggest contributing factors is uh, my dad. So we had, my grandfather owned a farm in mm -hmm. the San Fernando Valley and it's right directly in line with Van Nuys Airport. So there were the only two houses, it was him, the Clears and the Dakes. And they both owned what would equate to, I don't know what it was in acres, but probably a residential block you okay. know of the San Fernando Valley yeah. right and then as as everything progressed of course he didn't want to be a farmer anymore he actually went to work for uh, grandpa went to work for Kuroff Electronics and Kuroff got bought out by Federated and if you remember those Fred rated or Federated commercials they were like real jokey commercials yeah. about Federated Electronics they bought out Kuroff Electronics anyway so they sold off the farm and the Dakes did the same thing and um for the for my mom and dad's wedding gift they gave them one of the lots 
So that's cool. So it was like they retained like six city lots and their house was right in the middle. And it basically went from Devonshire Street to Blackhawk. And then, you know, all the houses around there, there was, you know, a house on Devonshire and a house on Blackhawk and an alley, right? So we had this corner a lot and I could go right out my back gate and go right into my grandparents' house. And it was awesome. And we had this huge, and he still had the remnants of, he probably had six or seven orange trees and it was an orange farm. That's cool. And, uh, and so we, you know, kids, we had this big lot to play on, but they had a front lawn and they had a back lawn that was like the size of four volleyball courts. Okay. Then we had a front lawn and we had a back lawn. And then we had this parkway that was 12 lots long, you know, the area between yep. the sidewalk and the, and the street, yep. you know, three mowers wide. And, you know, parents were smarter back then because they used to tell us that we couldn't do things, which made us want to do things like <laughs> run the lawnmower, right? No, 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 no. Oh. You're too young for this young man. No, no, I can do it, right? Where now we're coddling these kids and they don't want to do anything, right? So I was Huck Finned right into uh, mowing the lawn, right? And he said at the time, and I think I was nine, maybe eight, barely pushed the mower, I'll give you $2 if you mow our front lawn, our back lawn, the parkway, and grandpa and grandma's lawn. I get to mow all that lawn? And get two bucks? And get $2, right? And, you know, as I got better at it, but even as at 18 or 17, 14, whatever yeah. it was, it still paid two bucks. I never mowed all those lawns for anything more <laughs> than two dollars, <laughs> right? The build character. When, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and when I would go to school, and my dad was, you know, he's an engineer. Yeah. So he's really good at figuring out exactly what things cost. And then he'd give you like two dollars too little, right? So while I was in school, he said, all right, I'm gonna pay for your gas. I'll give you a tank of gas every week. And, you know, so basically I got like 18 or 20 bucks. Well, I smoked at the time because it was cool. Well, you know, it was the 90s. We yeah. were kids, right? And uh, so I could fill up my truck and I could buy a pack of cigarettes with that money that it took, right? But then I would run out of cigarettes and I needed to do something like mow a goddamn lawn. And then I could buy like four more packs of cigarettes because cigarettes were, you know, 50 cents at the time or whatever mm-hmm. they were, 65 cents. I, you know, it wasn't five bucks or 10 bucks or whatever they were. Right. It was cheap gas money was you know a few bucks for the night right so i figured so every week i had to struggle to figure out how i was going to keep smoking and how i was going to keep going to school and uh so i would just do odd jobs and do whatever i could whatever i could until i was obviously employed but i think that two dollars for mowing you know 17 football fields worth of lawn with a push mower that wasn't power assisted probably contributed to uh and my nicotine habit probably contributed to my work ethic and uh but he didn't really you know i mean he wasn't a mean dad we had a little ski boat little 16 foot water ski boat we went water skiing and they had this amazing group of friends and um and i had a dirt bike you know nothing spectacular you know 10 year old dirt bike you know whatever you know and as i progressed i had he kept a dirt bike right you know under me until i was you know big enough to ride his and he just gave me his because he was getting too old to ride it And, um, but it was, everything was always, um, it was always a pain in the butt to get it out of them. Hey dad, can I use your dirt bike? Mm, I don't know. You know, Hey dad, can I borrow five bucks? No, no. Didn't matter what he had. It was always, he always forced me to go out and figure it out on my own. And, uh, so I, I think, I think. You know, and, and I never just got toys. You know, yeah, I'd get stuff for my birthday. Right, but, you never, but if I wanted something, I I had to get it. There had to be some skin and some effort, some hundred percent. Yeah, and then maintaining it. Yep. And then when I had that little Datsun truck, when I came back, it was kind of a turd, seventy-eight Datsun truck, which would probably be worth about fifteen thousand dollars right now. You know, which I paid four hundred and eighty dollars for right. it, and um, and you know, it wasn't super reliable. But he he said, all right sell your truck work up some money and whatever you get I'll match because you need something reliable to go to school neighbor Craig had a little S10 it was pretty nice yep. you know and he wanted ah, give me 2500 bucks and at the time it had air conditioning and I didn't have air conditioning so I was, I was pretty, hot, pretty hot to, yeah. to get that little little S10 so I came up with 1250 bucks and that's the only time that like you know like he did anything like that 
and it was wow. only because I was in school. So, and then I just, I, you know, I mean, we were, we were a mechanical generation. Um, I always wanted a better BMX bike. I used to break because we raced BMX as kids, okay. and I would crack frames and bend forks and do all these things, and I always wanted that, you know, I always needed a new bike, so I had to mow lawns and do whatever I could for that. Where'd you get it? And, um, God, the odd job. I'm thinking back to the odd jobs I did in that neighborhood as a kid just to make, you know, 50 cents or yeah. five bucks. The Myopia Collective. Cooper Vision and the AOA have partnered in a groundbreaking initiative to change the way optometrists in the U.S. treat children with myopia. The purpose of the Myopia Collective is to rally the profession of optometry and its allies to interrupt the status quo and elevate the new standard of care for children with myopia. Every individual is encouraged to become a member of the collective. By joining, you commit to taking action to help slow the progression of myopia in children. You'll receive updates and information about the collective and its work in the fight against myopia, gain access to educational opportunities and resources offered by the collective, and hear from change agents, the ambassador optometrists selected to serve as advocates for community and policy change that facilitates the mission of the collective. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the show notes to join the collective today. In the past, our focus revolved around prescribing MacuHealth or MacuHealth Plus to patients at risk of macular degeneration, while also recommending it to collegiate and professional athletes for enhanced contrast sensitivity in sports performance. However, this year's introduction of the Life Meter has been a game changer. The Life Meter revealed a concerning truth. Many of my patients have alarmingly low skin carotenoid levels, indicating potential deficiencies in essential body tissues like the retina and brain. Supported by over 30 peer-reviewed publications, LifeMeter's accuracy, consistency, and effectiveness has been demonstrated across 2,000 subjects with diverse backgrounds. With this newfound insight, I can now have meaningful conversations about carotenoid levels with all of my patients, even those who may seem outwardly healthy. To learn more about this empowering technology, feel free to contact your MacuHealth representative or click on the link in the show notes. Together, let's optimize patient care and elevate their well-being. Well, it probably taught you too that there's no job that's, I mean, there's no ego in the job, right? A job was a job. Job's a job. And yeah. you're, not, you're not too good or too high or too low to do any one job. You know, that ego, um, you know, I, I, I would say I'm probably the, the, one of the more arrogant sons of bitches out there, right? But in a comical way. But I've, I've, I don't think I've ever let my ego, I can't say that I've never let it screw me over, but I'm pretty good at, at putting it aside and getting the job done, regardless of, of yeah. whether or not it's quote unquote demeaning, but I've, I don't, I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't think there is a demeaning job. If somebody's no. paying you to do something reasonable, you just do it. Well, you just do it and, and. You also under, do a very good job because <clears throat> I've asked you for help on some things where I've watched you do it and felt really dumb that I didn't figure that out on my own. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure in your head, <laughs> you've said, Aaron, you're a smart guy and this yeah. is the dumbest question you've yeah. asked me. But, but right, in, in, and you've asked me some questions. I'm like, well, that's just, that was basic. I, I know that, but, you know, it, the... Um, but to your point, there's no, there, there hasn't been an ego. I don't see your ego in. I see your, 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 your confidence, right? right. Certainly funny, yeah. and uh, you got some opinions, right? Who doesn't? Yeah, fair enough. Um, but I haven't seen an ego, right? By any means, get in the way, and right. and you're quick to say, hey, I was wrong when you were wrong. Yep. Right. When somebody else has a different idea, you're mm -hmm. quick to, to, like, let's evaluate, let's explore it. Let's yeah. Look no. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I mean, it's not, I'm not, uh, I'm not here to. Um I, I try not to beat my chest too much, and um, and I try to I try to be humble uh, when it's time. Mm -hmm. um, the that's I, God, that's it's such a hard skill to learn, humility, but God, it's the best one I got. Um, you know the the neat thing is, um, I think I I don't know. You know, there's a lot of things that contributed to that, and I think the biggest thing that contributed contributed to it for me was was getting my butt kicked. Right, and that that started in elementary school. I mean, we were fighting in elementary school, all the way through junior high, even in high school in Tahoe. You know, I mean, everybody. You know, it's just it's what you did in the '90s. But obviously, it was a little worse in the valley. Mm -hmm. And then it continued when I moved back, and um, 
and we got into some some really gnarly things as 20 year olds you know situations that I look back I'm like how are we even alive you know because yeah. um, that neighborhood was still rough when I moved back and the same people were still there and all the same things were still happening yeah. and uh, so uh, Encino's fairly nice but it's still like there's not a good part of the valley you have to live in the hills mm-hmm. you know and, and, and the only reason I say that is because thieves and bums and, and riffraff and things like that tend to be lazy so they don't really walk up the hills you know there was a lot of foot traffic in that neighborhood there was a lot of bicycle traffic there was a lot of skateboard traffic and it was all flat the whole San Fernando Valley is flat flat square grid um, but yeah I think I think the um, learning where people's lines are crossing them losing is probably the the most humbling experience yeah. you know and especially working with these knuckleheads working with the SEAL teams thank God there's a SEAL team because those guys would just either they would be in jail for violent crimes or they would be really successful there's no in between and um, and you, you need a place for those guys and uh, and then going in there and, and, and you know holding my own respectively yeah. you know I mean uh, there's some of the toughest men in the world my God break glass in case of war but um but and and again everybody's fighting everybody all the time yep. you know and uh and that'll teach you to be humble real quick you know the other the other point you brought up is was being able to fix things here we go back to dad right um the i always wanted to know how things worked mm-hmm. you know whatever it was yeah. whatever it was how's that little wind up spring work on, on your toy truck right and, and I was constantly just like peeling my, breaking my toys and figuring them out, you know, and putting them back together. And then we had those, those RC cars, yeah. those little kits that you would cool. have to build from scratch, yeah. you know, right? And, um, and God, I wanted one of those for so long, but then I had to, you know, I needed $102 or whatever it cost at the time. A lot of lawn mowing. Yeah, and a lot of lawn mowing. And, uh, and, you know, I really wanted one of those. And then, and then uh, of course, it got hit by a car because I was playing with it in the street, and then I had to fix it. And, um, and <laughs> you know, <laughs> all the, all the yeah. things we did as kids, you yeah. know, I mean, I still remember, uh, my son Andrew's 20, he'll be 24 this year. Um, when he was about nine, I handed him a baseball and told him to go throw it through the neighbor's window. And he goes, well, why? And I said, because I've, I haven't had to talk to any neighbors like my dad did <laughs> about all the horrible crap we did as kids. And we were constantly just like destroying everything in the neighborhood. Yeah being you know drug home by our ear by by the by the uh-huh. by the neighbors you know what your kid did you know and then the parents would laugh and my parents would pay for it and whatever it was and and he never did any of that stuff and i i kind of feel bad because those are good humbling experiences they're very humble yeah and uh yeah. different generation because none of our kids oh yeah. i'm lucky they didn't do yeah mine didn't do a whole lot of dumb ones he's sitting behind the camera right now yeah 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 did some dumb things but not not to that extent um but I mean, getting humbled is—it's a good point. We don't hit it enough. You don't have well, to get hit in the face. Get humbled. No, I mean, you really business don't. Business will no, humble you. Life oh humbles my God, you. Business will humble you. Right? Yeah. Being you know, broke will humble you. Being broke will humble you. Mm-hmm. Doing ninety-five and getting pulled over. Yep. And yes, you got to pay no, that sir. ticket. That that'll oh, humble t- you. He can take me to jail on this one. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. Mine was uh, mine was in excess of a hundred, and uh, this was in the nineties, and I was probably twenty. And uh, I wanted an FCR 1000, you know, because okay. I was a motor- yeah. motorcycle guy. And so one day I, I think I sold the S10 or whatever reliable thing is, and I decided that owning just a motorcycle was going to be good enough for me. And um, it wasn't. I had to, you know, anyhow. So <laughs> I'd gone all the way out to Palmdale, which is about an hour north uh, through the hills in December, and it got late. And I was coming back, and it was cold, and I had the wrong shoes on. So I tucked down behind the windscreen, and it was it was like 1 or 2 in the morning. There's no one on the 14 freeway. And it's hilly. And, uh, and I, was, I just laid it out in fifth gear, home. and I'm going. And um, so I passed him, and I don't remember the exact freeway on-ramp that it was, but it was four miles, so it was probably like Bouquet Canyon where he was getting on. And then he pulled me over at like San Fernando Road four miles later. 
And he goes, did you even see me? First thing he says, so first thing, I'm tucked down, not looking at my mirrors. And I look over at the wall in the, in the fast lane, and I see red and blues on them. And at this point, I had had enough speeding tickets to pay, wallpaper this room. You know, because I, I had hot rods and, and you know, and, and again, when I was a little kid and drove fast and I raced cars and raced dirt bikes and speed limits didn't apply. But anyhow, so uh, so I dart over into the into the number two lane and I just let off the gas and he goes. <laughs> 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 and, you know, I just, I wasn't running, you know, yeah. so he slows down, he gets by me, we pull over. And again, there's, you know, I passed probably three cars in, in yeah. 30 miles, you know, it's late at night. And uh, and so I pull over and I'm shivering. I'm like that cold. You know, my feet are frozen and I'm like, look, man, I'm just trying to get home, I'm freezing my ass off. And uh, he goes, I'd pull you over, but I own one of these. I mean, he goes, I'd take you to jail, but I own one of these. And I know how easy that is to do. And it, had it just been a spurt, like had you just, you know, and then you slowed down, had it just lit you up and I would have flown on by. It took me four miles to catch you. And he said, you're doing about 130 on the ups probably about 155 160 on the way down so we would go up the hill and i'd catch up to you and on the way because i was pegged at 145 and uh i'm like wow that car will go 145 he's like oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah that's all it'll do <laughs> <laughs> you're pulling away from me yeah and he said you'd leave me on the downhills and i'd gain on you on the uphills and i'm like oh yeah you caught me on an uphill yeah and so we had a nice conversation and i asked him if he could ride it for 99 and he goes no not today but I'll let you go home. And uh, so anyway, uh, he wrote me for in excess of 100, and he put the little details there. And I thought I was slick, and I was going to go say something to the judge. And I stood in front of that judge, and I said, Your Honor, it was really, really cold. You know, and they let you talk. Yeah. You know, they let you talk. And he looks at me, and he goes, Oh, that's a good story. He goes, You were going well in excess of 100 miles an hour. You could have killed somebody. He goes, uh, The fines at the time... Fourteen hundred and eighty-six dollars. Would you like a payment plan? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "Oh my God, okay." And he goes, "Do you have your driver's license on you?" "Yes, sir." "You can approach the bench." And he goes, "You'll get that back in thirty days." <laughs> Here's the bus pass. Well, I was working. I think I was. Wor- I know for a fact I was working at Mark's Volvo, and I had I had sold the bike like actually prior to all this. I had sold the bike. And, uh, and he goes, oh, did you drive down here? I said, yes, yes, Your Honor. He goes, cool, call somebody to come pick you and your car up. I'll have an officer waiting at the exit of the parking lot with your, with your what kind of car do you drive? You know. <laughs> anyway, so anyhow, so the book hit me in the head, and I had lost my license for 30 days. It never showed up as a suspended license, so he just held on to it because he probably knew I wasn't going to do anything. Yeah. So I hired my friend to drive me to work every morning and then he could use my car, and then he could have to pick me up and take me home for 30 days. Yep. Could be worse. Uh, a little humbling, though. Very humbling. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Very humbling. Yeah. Lots of those. We well, had a chauffeur for dates then. It was a little like. Uh... Well, I was dating my <laughs> ex-wife at the time, and I think she had a car, but we weren't obviously living together, so I think that was okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that makes but, it uh, tough. Yeah. yeah, you're bringing up some memories here, boy. Yeah, humble I haven't pie. thought about those in a long time. Yeah, uh, well, the stories are cool because that's how they—that's where we come from, right? Right. And and in what world do you live in that you can have all these opportunities to succeed and to fail, and then to learn from your fails, failures, and uh, and step back up again, and then take all the little lessons and put mm-hmm. them into play. I'm I'm listening and uh, and how you talk or how you teach rather. And teaching's a skill, very, very difficult skill. It's a difficult skill. Um, and, and I don't know if you appreciate how good you are at it. Well, thank you. Because we can be, we just had a, a shooting class. I'm no good at golf, but throwing a smaller projectile right, far away. Yeah. Right? That's my version of, of, of golf, and I love mm-hmm. the math that's involved in it. I love the, the challenge. Yeah. Um, but we had a lot of 15 guys out, uh, students out, and ran the gamut. We had law enforcement officers, we had hobbyists, and team guys, a couple old, doctors, old. Yep. Guys, right? And no matter what their level was, you made them feel good about themselves and you gave them an opportunity to do better. 
Interesting. So it, 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 it I mean, where the grouping was, and, and I remember looking down the line and feeling proud of myself and saying, hey, I got a pretty good group. But, you know, I, I, I think I shot under the time limit. And uh, you said, that's a nice group, Aaron, but this one over here is a little bit off. And yeah, you made it under the time, but you need to go faster. <laughs> So you, so you didn't kill my spirits, but like you, you gave me something to work towards. Right. And the guy right. next to me, whose pistol shooting looked a little bit more like a shotgun shot, right? right? Scattered all over. Hey, good job just to do a little bit like this and it's going to tighten up. And so it was, right, it, it, you, you gave everybody what they needed to right. keep the confidence, but you also pushed them because you knew what their levels were and how they could do better. Right. Yeah, and, that's your uh, job. So you manage, the, you manage the expectations, you manage the humility. Mm. Right, and uh, um, I never once looked down and said, "Oh, I'm feeling good about myself." Like I just looked at me and said, "Hey, I can do better," and I'm, I did good. I can do even better. Yeah. The um, and then uh, uh, my favorite part of your classes is when something goes wrong, because everything's easy when something goes right. 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 And going wrong, I mean, no, nobody got shot. If you're yeah, go to shooting, right? Yeah. Everything goes wrong. Anyway. Everything, goes, everything yeah. goes wrong everywhere you right. are. Right. right. Driving your kid to school, you're going wrong. If you're you're gonna hit every red light, you're gonna Especially if you're stuck late. behind somebody, yep. right? If you're running late, so something goes wrong. So there's going to be a mechanical failure. There's going to be uh, in the in the the weapon. There's going to be something. And most experts will step in at one point and be like, "Okay, let me take over from here." Oh. And you, yes. One, make sure the situation's safe because we're working with firearms. But two, you, you say, um, and I stole this. So if my staff's listening to it, this is where I got it from. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to work it through? And even when I'm working through it the wrong way. You don't correct. I'll figure it out. Right. Right. Okay. Right. What are you going to do? Okay. Well, you there. worked yourself into another corner. Now, how you work yourself back out of that one? Right. There's a method to that. That's um. That's actually. I didn't make that up. That's a. That's a team level. Um, that's something that I picked up in the teams, and I don't know. You know, I, I'm not going to say that that I didn't approach things like that. You know, but yeah. the. I when I. Uh, We'll digress a little bit. When I sat yeah. down to open ASDS, I looked at everything that was wrong in the industry, right? And the the whole, like, army training, yelling mentality out on the range, you know, we don't do that. And mm -hmm. I mean, there's times for it, like when we're putting pressure on you, well, you know, yeah. we'll be like, ah, what are you doing? But that's putting pressure, but, you're not. But that's in the moment, it's usually yeah. super comical. But it's, it's, <laughs> it's making you, it's making, we're trying to make you fail. Yeah. And everything that I learned in the teams, they want their it's designed to make you fail so you rise none of the training is there to um, to reward false confidence right and and that hands-off approach of just standing there and all right you know they're a little more brutal all right tell me what are you gonna do yeah you know that's that's the whole mentality is is and it's amazing it's amazing the the training that they have, even at the platoon level, at the highest levels, how they're pushing you, it's in a book. Really? They don't make it up. You know, this is what you're going to do. This is how you're going to react. This is going to be the temperature of the day. This is how long they can be in the water. If they've been in the water this long, they have to be exercised and out of the water this long. And the, the chart is just amazing. And it's an entire book. Oh, wow. How much suffering the human can do. But even... You know, that's at the entry level, but uh, but even on the higher up level, that just kind of falls into place, and and everything is approached that way, you know, and and because it, they know in the time of war, nothing goes right, nothing does, not everything fails. Yeah. Murphy's Murphy's on your shoulder, <laughs> yeah. and 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 so the the key statement that they have, or the the thing they like to say is, uh, no decision is w worse than a bad decision. So making no decision in the moment making no decision. Is, is worse than making a bad decision. And if, if, you know, if the choices are left and right, and left is worse than, than right, staying in the middle is worse than either of those, right? And it, it kind of falls back to getting, on the, getting off the X, right? Yep. What's better, to return fire or get to cover? I don't know. The situation is going to dictate it, but I would say that 83% you know, pulling pulling that out of the air, right? Of the situations are gonna, uh, if somebody's shooting at you, I would say get to cover is the first thing, yeah. right? Especially if you're not like ready to engage. Um, but returning fire is an adequate answer. Is it the right answer? I don't know, but at least you're doing something, yeah. right? You might get lucky, and I would rather be lucky than good any day of the week. Yeah. And both those are situations you've trained for, so it's not 
Right. right? We're not we're not just panicking, throwing our heads up, running in circles. Right. right? But, so back to looking at the industry, yeah. what I learned, and I learned this in the, uh, <laughs> the military was great. I showed up like just like an eager idiot, you know, I'm like, I'm like, we're all going to get paid the same. Everybody's going to be happy. Nobody's going to be screwing me for money like they've been screwing me for the last 11 working years of my life, right? Uh, because outside in the real world, that's everybody's just going to screw you for money, yeah. right? Bottom line. There's a couple power-hungry corporate entities, you know, things like that, but it's usually associated with more money. Well, in the military, they just screw you for little marks on pieces of paper that eventually get them a little bit more money a few years later, right? And and I really learned that people are, are in the military, they'll just screw you to screw you. It's crazy. But then I started thinking back, you know, after a couple of years in the military, a lot of these guys come in and they don't know, they don't know anything different. And the other thing that they don't know is, and especially coming from the outside, is there's when you're training and you're not at the team level, you're just in the regular Navy, most of the stuff you're doing really doesn't have to be done, right? You know, so busy work. there's, there's, yeah, it's busy work. It's, it's, uh, you know, you're, you're here, you're keeping your, your troops late because you think the chief wants you to see you there late you know i mean it's just so convoluted of bad ideas and and just just bullshit work and and i'm like none of this really needs to get done you know so i would cut my guys loose all the time once i made like any kind of platoon leader or squad leader or uh situate you know position i i would this is what we have to do today this is what's on the list when that's done you're gone and um and and those guys would would go to the end of the earth for me because I treated them with respect, yeah. you know? And the only thing you really have to barter with in the military is their time, you know? But if you screwed me over or you didn't do it, I'd pull you back at about six o'clock in the evening, you know, and we're gonna, we'll do this now, yeah. you know? But um, but I learned a lot about about humans and, and, it's, and it's really sad uh, how, how easy it is to, for somebody to screw somebody over. And, uh, and I'm not I'm not wired like that. Like I've always I've always been the kid in the neighborhood that beats up the bully, you know. Um, and I was never I was never a fight picker, you know. Yep. Um, and uh, and and if I was picking a fight, it was picking a fight with a guy that's done something wrong to somebody else in the neighborhood. It's deserving. Yeah. Right. And and I'm just I'm just not really wired like that. Uh, and it and it's always kind of bothered me. So, so seeing that, that learning about how 95% of the people are just going to screw you over for a mark on a piece of paper really settled me in to, to how I uh, read and react with people. But, um, but anyway, I don't know how we got on that topic. I think we got there because the, I was just learning that people are going to screw you either way. But anyhow, back to the training. Yeah. Uh, the military style training where the guys are yelling and screaming and and in these schools and and their and their um, and their you know macho bravado crap. Um, the it, it it's usually covering something up. And and the more I worked with the top tier guys, the more I learned that the guys that had actually done something were super low key mm -hmm. and super chill. And all the guys that never really did anything. <coughs> David Goggins um, were always the macho bravado and I'm the best at this and I'm the best at that and the more I really started hanging out with the real the real, we'll just call them the Foxtrot felons um, the only SEAL team ever disbanded in the history of the SEAL teams and so then most of those guys are really good friends of mine and some of the toughest dudes you will ever meet in your life are always the first ones to grab the bags, shopping bags, out of the old lady that they don't know, hands, and carry them to their door if they if they happen to be walking by, or holding the door for women or um, or anybody. You know what I mean? And they're so polite, yep. and and just so good to be around until they get drunk. You know what I mean? But that's when you know when the life. fun happens, yeah. right? And and I don't mean they just turn into to buttheads but they're they're gonna fight you know um and and they're most of them are fun drunks i'm just saying it's uh the fuse gets a little shorter yeah. um the uh but it really it really taught me a lot about about how 
um, how easy it is to be nice and how uh, how well received being nice is. Yeah. And I think my history of all the silly stuff I've done for the government, my all this stupid crap and the war and the Marshall's SWAT team and all that stuff, and I don't, you know, when it's time to turn the switch on, I'll turn the switch on, and until then I'm going to be really nice. Yeah. And I think that that looking at that from the outside draws a lot of clients in. You know, not seeing that yelling, not seeing that screaming, yeah. seeing like, hey, this is what is expected and we're going to let you learn. Um, and if I take the gun out of your hand, like that macho guy, give me that. What have you learned? No. Nothing. Well, I've learned, not only not learned something positive, I've learned negative and now I've got a, mm -hmm. a, and now a you have deficit more, that I have to overcome. More fear of the firearm, yeah. right? And the other thing that we do is we, I mean, how many classes have you been to? And even some of the upper echelon classes that I've been to, they'll make you download your weapon before you go back to reload. Yeah. And that doesn't build confidence in having a loaded firearm on your hip. You know, and that's one of the things that, you know, once we get into the little bit more, you know, into the 1.5s and 2.5s, we encourage you to make sure that your pistol is loaded and in your holster and you don't take it out of your holster when you go back to reload. And we, and we teach you how to work through those things. Yeah. Um, a lot of that babysitting mentality uh, I wanted to eliminate from the school. And I think it's 11 years now that we've been open and we've had that many incidents. Zero. Right. Yeah. You know. There's a lot of, I mean, think about when we learn to drive a car. Mm -hmm. Right. You're operating a tool that's responsible for taking lots of lives every year. Yes. And you don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And you're in it with your parent next to you. I, for the life of me, if my kid does something dumb, there's not a whole lot I'm going to do grab the wheel out of their hands and right. call it, make it worse. Right. Right. Scream and yell and freak out. Mm -hmm. Pull and, the e-brake. Uh, yeah, hopefully. Right. As long as well, we have an e-brake now. Right. Figure out where the little button yeah. is, right, yeah. for your electronic one. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of confidence when you get to do it yourself. And I just, I did something. Right. Right. And even if it's, I drove two miles to the store and back and I stopped at the red light and made it through and I kind of parked in my parking spot mm -hmm. um, as, as a new, uh, new driver. Um, as I'm listening to you tell the story and what I, I, what keeps telling my head is that you and then, um, and I've met some, had the pleasure of meeting some of these guys that were the humblest guys in the world and I had no idea who they were until right. you told me after the fact, right? Right. They know their identity. Mm -hmm. They know who they are. Yep. They know their strengths and their weaknesses. 100%. And in knowing it, they don't have to prove it to anybody else. No. We're the ones who who don't know their identity or who are insecure in their identity, mostly because they don't know it, are always on show because they're, they're afraid somebody's going to see them for who they are. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Right? Yeah. And, and knowing your weaknesses is super awesome because I know what I'm not good at and what I need help with. Right. Right? Yeah. And I know what my strengths are because I know when to step up and put that skill to use to help myself or help others. So it's that it's that that identity, and I think you way of looking at it. I think you get that identity when you when you've been tested. All right, as I shared at the beginning, this is the first half half of the conversation with uh, Matt Clear. Join us next week on the podcast episode to hear the second half of uh, this episode. If you have any questions or comments, please uh, reach out to me. Let me know. Share with a friend if you want to contact Matt. His contact information is in the show notes. And we look forward to connecting with you and sharing the second half of this discussion next week.